pretty much all week, when you're doing a transformation like Thomas Cook, I work. So uh, I work, um, I go back, it doesn't really matter where, but I go back uh, to a small room and I, I work. And, um, and then sometimes I do a breakfast, I rarely do lunch, uh, I don't particularly like to do, to do dinner. So I think when you're doing this scale of transformation, you have to be very, very committed. And then I'm traveling. Thomas Cook is in 86 different destinations. We have 16 hard sites in Europe. So the last two weeks, I've just been traveling around and doing much the same thing, getting to a little hotel room, doing my work. So it's actually nowhere near as glamorous as you say. It doesn't sound glamorous it's not, to me at all. <laughs> because that's what transformation is. I'm always a bit surprised when you read about someone who goes to do a transformation and says, after a year or so, oh, God, you know, that was so heavy duty. I never saw my family. I kept getting colds. I mean, that's the nature of doing something where you're taking an organism that's not very well and making it much better. It is heart and soul, a lot of time and energy, but you don't do it forever. It's, it's relatively short period of intensity to get the patient off the operating table, into remission, and then fully well. What on earth did you want to take something on like that for? Because it wasn't a sector that you were familiar with. You, you, you were amazingly successful at Premier Farnell before. It was something totally different. You were in a good position there. I mean, what possessed you to want to go for something like that? Because it was in a really bad way, wasn't it? Well, I, I think that this is where one of the sort of misnomers is and how I think often, and I know we have some in the room headhunters, in that actually many of the elements of making Thomas Cook well I had done before. So I've done a lot of transformations in four different continents. Um, taking businesses that aren't digital and making them digital, uh, doing jobs where 64 different acquisitions had to come together instead of little silos being one business. Um, businesses that maybe had some cash issues. So the fact I didn't know travel uh, um, was pretty evident, but the fact that I had done many different types of transformations, how do you get teams together? How do you take the energy of a burning platform? Uh, how do you take a business that's not connected digitally and make that happen? How do you sell and position a story? So actually, Thomas Cook is not the hardest job sure. that I've, I've done. But did it occur to you for one minute that you might fail, though, and what you would have done if it hadn't worked? <clears throat> well. I think um, despite the sort of belief and the will, I'm actually quite a factual person. So I did very, very thorough due diligence on all that was available. And I thought that actually there were four or five things that made this very doable. It's a great brand. It's very hard to kill a great brand. And as I began to talk to people, there was a lot of love for the Thomas Cook brand. It wasn't a sort of unloved bitch of a company. It was something people had memories and experiences around. Secondly, had really good gross margins. So the value that customers attributed to the service and the products was, was very good. It had scale, you know, 10 billion British pounds, and it's an industry that benefits from scale. Uh, 90 planes, a very strong business in Nordic and Central Europe. And so, the problems, you know, is basically a very solid business with a terrible balance sheet that had been allowed to, you know, get a little more unwell. So I actually thought it, it was doable with a good wind, lots of luck, lots of hard work. So there are jobs I've looked at and thought, mm, I don't think so. This one isn't quite as doable sure. or I am not, not suited to that. So I, it, it wasn't just blind uh, Bodicea belief. It, it actually was based on due diligence, a practical review, and that there was a fighting chance sure. with a good wind, D we could do it. Describe day one. What did you do when you walked in through the door? For the well, actually, um, in all my new roles, in the roles that I've exited, I've had succession. So I've been able to leave quite quickly. And in the month of July, before I started at Thomas Cook in August, I spoke to anyone and everyone who would talk to me about the company. Customers who traveled and were happy, customers who weren't, the press, the investors, 24 by 7, just listen. Loads and loads and loads of inputs, and you begin to see themes 
and uh, a former picture. And the first month in the company doing exactly that, going into rooms like this or little rooms, listening to people, talking to people. On day one, I sent out uh, you know, a digitized link uh, saying, I want your views. You tell me what works, what doesn't, uh, you know, what the problems are, who the problems are. And I got 8,000 detailed responses within a month. And so listening, and, and one of the things I did when, when an organization is not well, is I have my little book, one of my you know, neat little books, whether it's pink or red or black, and I sort of write my inputs in there. And then I share back to the teams, you know, this is what I'm sort of thinking, these are the five sort of things, and they say, oh, no, no, you've got that one wrong, that's not a problem. Or, and so it's not massive, huge, intimidating PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. It's their strategy. And actually, we just completed uh, our second global engagement survey. And it's very rare when you do transformations that the second year people are happier than the first year because you've restructured, you know, you've, you've had to you know, change some roles, reduce some roles. And we've seen a quantum positive shift of over 4% in engagement. And I think that stems back to day one that people know that they believe in the strategy. It's actually their strategy. Mm -hmm. They told me what to do. And pretty much, people didn't always know how to, but they did know, they were highlighting the obstacles, the issues, and with some help, you could solve those. So I, I think it's listening and, and bringing people in that this is theirs. Well, what was the single most difficult thing that you had to do, or that you are continuing to do? What, what <clears throat> of those knotty problems, which is the one that's given you the most grief? Yeah, I think um, the company was totally siloed. So there was a little Swedish business doing wonderful Swedish things, a little German business, and bringing people together. I don't really care about sharing best practice. How quaint. I want best practice embedded really quickly. So bringing people together uh, uh, on the basis of a huge, the largest survey of travelers in which many myths were broken. So getting people together, sharing and embedding best practice, making the organization think technology and digital, because travel is technology and digital, and, and we weren't quite there. Um, understanding and working with the huge supplier community, the hoteliers uh, 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 in the world. So there are many things that aren't done. You can't do a transformation on this sort of scale in a year or two years. I usually say it's about six years made up of two phases. Mm -hmm. so the first phase where we issued the targets for the first part is, is really proving that you're coming out of remission, that you're, you're pretty well. And uh, we go to the city next week with our second year of results mm -hmm. and to show you know, if and how the company has become fitter and better. So we're absolutely not done. And I think one of the key things is that you don't, you know, the first year, everyone's like, oh, this is amazing. We thought Thomas Cook was dead. Hurrah. The second year, everyone thinks, oh, but you must be able to do X, Y, Z. You're done. You're transformed. And you need to show that that's, you know, still in process, still happening, training, developing, coaching people. So it really is a journey. Okay. Let's talk about how you come to be here because you did it, your degree was in ancient... Medieval. Medieval history. And in, at that stage, you thought it was, you were going to be a teacher or work at the BBC. Yeah. And then son, that somehow you moved into commerce, into business. How did that occur? Well, you, you make it sound a bit more thought out than it actually was. Uh, actually, uh, a German I was with last week said to me, why on earth did you do medieval history? Uh, uh, and I said, which is the truth, well, because I could. In Britain, I think we do further education based on what we like not uh, just to get a job. I'm not saying what's wrong or right, but there are, in this room, people who are trained to be lawyers, uh, people who thought they could get very good jobs after their degrees, and those of us who clearly hadn't thought about it very much, and I was in the latter category. And then when I was sort of coming to year three, and I started to talk about what I might do, and the head of careers at London University said, well, it's the BBC or teaching for you. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, and those didn't pan out, so um, I read um, uh, uh, an advert 
uh, in a magazine that no longer exists. Uh, uh, and it said, we're looking for women with integrity to train uh, as management trainees in electronics. So I went along, and that's how it started. And what did it you seem to me like a pretty natural oldest child. Do you, you are a real oldest child, aren't you? And you, you sadly, you lost your dad, didn't you when, you, when he was ill from when you were 11 and died when you were 14. So what, what effect has that had on your kind of, your makeup and to what extent has it sort of made you the individual you are now? I think you're absolutely right. I'm, you know, the eldest and us eldest children have some very similar characteristics. I think just then what happened and where we lived, uh, you know, in the middle of Nowhereville, that I was old enough to provide my mom, who was really struggling, I think, um, with some practical help. You know, it was quite, quite bright, quite forthright, quite fearless, really, and, and she wasn't. And so being able to help her and help my siblings, I think that was just a natural thing to do. I never sort of, I don't think you think about it when you're 11 and 12 in that way. I do think the one, I think losing a parent in your, in your childhood, very much the age determines your reaction. Mm -hmm. I think I was old enough to take some positives, and one of the real positives for me, and I think about this every single day, and I'm sure it's connected psychologically to my sleeping patterns, is, you know, we could die tomorrow, any one of us. So we should try and make today count. And I, I'm very conscious. And I have siblings who, because of the age and the impact that they were, it's like, hey, we could die tomorrow. Let's just chill, you know? Let's not, let's not completely be so intense and worked up about everything. So I think it does depend on your personality and your, your age uh, and that sort of, you know, natural disposition you have. The other thing, you, you married relatively late, didn't you? Mm. And you and you have two stepchildren. Yes. But but none but not your own. Now tell me about that relationship because that's a interesting and sometimes tricky relationship. Yeah. But you 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 look as if you've made that work pretty well. Oh yeah, I think it's the biggest, toughest, hardest thing I've ever do. Forget about doing transformation. So yes, I um I uh, met my husband-to-be, and I think it was our second date, and... You decided after seven minutes you were going seven to marry seconds. him. Seven seconds. I knew sorry, it seven right. seconds, okay. yeah. It took him nine months. <laughs> it's men for you, right? Oh, sorry. The photographer's looking a bit appalled at that comment. <laughs> but, um... Don't worry, he's used to it. <laughs> but, um, um, and he, I think it was the second date, and he said, you know, I need to tell you about, you know, George and Gemma, who, who live with me at home in Oxford, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So I sort of took on the Clarksons, uh, and I, I thought you know, two adults will be fine. But a sort of 11 and 14 year old, I was very anxious about, you know, all sorts of small things. Like when we met, I lived in New York and I, I just had this kitchen that was actually smaller than that. But I had this wonderful drawer full of takeout menus. And I thought, am I gonna have to change that way of living? And for those of you who've been to Oxford and seen the takeout array, you, you know that that would have to change. So, so there were more changes around you know, the, the, and, and children of that age, they don't, they're not interested in what you do. But I think, had they been very little, I would have been useless. Did they take to you quickly or did it take not, time? Not really, I don't think. I, think. I think it was better they were teenagers because I was, I think some of the businesses I've run at times I felt were entirely <laughs> organized in spirals of teenagers. Uh, uh, and so... I actually think I played that much better than if they were toddlers, but it, it takes time, and I think some basic rules, some disciplines between us all. You know, sure. they're not my children, and I don't get to make the rules, but equally, um, we all moved in together, so yeah. some respect, and I think when you're not a biological mother, but a responsible mother, you, you can make some very good decisions as well. Sure. That, that uh, stay with them. So it took time and energy. Right. Now, one of the things we've been discussing today, which has come up actually surprisingly often, is the issue of, of resilience and how that's, yes. that's necessary, maybe even particularly ne necessary for women in business I agree. these days. Um, does, was that partly because of your background, something that, you, you know, you strike me as quite tough mm. and, you know, you, you, you could go through quite a lot. Is that mm. right? I mean, uh, do you feel a very strong and resilient individual? 
Well, I, I guess I'm like most women. I, on any given day, I feel a whole array of things from <laughs> pathetic and useless and fragile to I wouldn't fuck with me if I were you. So it's mm -hmm. the complete... I wouldn't. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the complete array of emotions. But generally, I think I'm lucky in that I'm healthy. And I think because of what happened in my childhood, I've always been focused on being fit, eating well, taking care of myself. I feel that there's a responsibility. There's so many wild cards out there that you could get, you know, uh, an illness, a cancer that you, you couldn't have prevented, mm -hmm. that you kind of have to increase your own odds by staying very healthy. So sure. from a very early age, I remember when I first came to London, we didn't ever really drink tea or coffee, and we certainly didn't drink fizzy drinks. I mean, I don't think they were distributing... Uh, uh, Probably most people in this room are too young to remember White's Lemonade, but they probably didn't distribute that. So when I came to London, it was where I started to try coffee and Coca-Cola. Uh, people were trying other things, uh, but coffee and Coca-Cola were too much for my head, just made me wired. So, so I've always been physically much tougher than I seem uh, uh, in terms of, you know, small or... or I remember, particularly when running businesses in the States, when the six-foot-six, 200-pound six, guy walks into the room you sort of feel little, you know? So physically quite resilient. And then I think because of living and working on four different continents with different cultures and different people, you know, living and working in Korea, your boss seems a long way away. You know, who's going to be bailing you out of the most sexist evening of your life except you? And so I think you just build up one of the pieces of advice I always give is get as many as experiences as you, as you can. Don't be mm -hmm. these tall, thin leaders who, who just want to get to the top. You know, I, I remember when my boss, we just bought lots of businesses in sub-Saharan Africa, and he said, so who'd like to volunteer to help me out here? And I always hate it when no one does, so I sort of said, oh, I will. So I went to sub-Saharan Africa to run the businesses that we bought, and... I learned so much there. It didn't progress my career, so when I came back, I was promoted immediately. But it, it's made me able to cope with things and to, to rely on my stamina and believe in myself because sure. I've got so many experiences. Sure. I mean, you're clearly resilient. Do you think you can be a bit scary as well to those, to those around you? I don't think you so. You don't think so? Not at all? I think I'm a kitten cat. <laughs> <laughs> But the, you, you said that... Um, what am I going to say, one honestly? Quotes, you, one of the quotes I read Do from I you was that you, you? should... No, no, no. <laughs> you, you should get... <laughs> you said that people should get food from my energy, and that yeah. was quite interesting, that. So you, yeah. I mean, that's, a, I mean, that's, a, that, no, you know, that's, that's quite a generous thing to say as well. That you want people to kind of feed off you as well. Well, actually, I think... I don't... I mean, that could be construed kind of very narcissistically. What I mean is that one of the jobs of a CEO, particularly in a transformation, is however wonderful your team are, they'll get tired or grumpy or... or but I can't. My job is to be constant and effortlessly giving to the pot of energy. And I think that's critical in, in, in transformations. And as I have a lot of it, then I make it widely available to help when you get the peaks and troughs mm -hmm. in the energy or the morale mm -hmm. of, of your team. For example, you know, when we started at Thomas Cook, the share price, you know, dropped and then it went really high. And then in the second year with the travel industry issues and, and perhaps, you know, we weren't breaking through every target, we were hitting them. And people were so kind of shocked and worried and, and, and what did this mean? And, and, you know, it doesn't mean anything if we're doing the right things and we're making progress. And people look to you when you lead mm -hmm. and and I don't I think you should always be authentic always be as you are but I think giving energy to the team sure if it's something you have a lot of yeah uh, um, you know like I don't have lots of patience so I don't really give my I don't say to my team take as long as you like Hannah you know just whenever you're ready <laughs> so I don't do that I'll bet you don't <laughs> because I don't have much patience and it has to be done really 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 quickly but what I mean but, but, one of the risks with someone with a, with, with, with a kind of a metabolism and a character and an energy like yours must be burning out, mustn't it? I mean, you know... You've well, got, I'm 52 you, and I haven't yet. No, but... And I've done some scary things. Yeah, 
But I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested that well, you're... Where, where is this logical connection between energy, um, metabolism and, and burnout? I don't think it's scientifically proven. I don't know anyone, you know, uh, uh, who... I think burnout happens when you're not well, yeah. when you're not happy, mm -hmm. when you're not doing things that, that are good for you. And of course, things that happen to any one of us that you can't plan for, depression or, or an illness. Sure. So I, I actually think, you know, I never think about it, but I do take very good care of myself. I train every day. Uh, I eat, I think, very well and have done for a long, long time. So I, I don't uh, think there's, you know, a potential, I don't... But why does your guru say then that you're coming up a bit short? What, My... does, what does he mean? I read that... Cause, that because yeah, you're interested in Buddhism, aren't you, as well? Ah, yes. So I thought you and meant my height. Yeah, no, that no, is no. <laughs> The heels get higher and I get shorter. There's nothing I can do about that, you know. I mean, it's like dating someone and saying, oh, are, are you ever going to get to that point of. You so, know, my, the, no, no, the, my Buddhist, the Sivananda guru, and the, yeah. the issue is that I'm probably going to be able to embrace fully Buddhism as a philosophy. Yeah. But there seems to be a major disconnect in my psyche between the religion of Buddhism and me. So. The sense that um, you must accept that which happens to you um, is quite hard for me. I, mm. I feel a need to want to change things and to not have mm. this happen <laughs> in that particular way. And so I don't we all? Uh, yes, <laughs> but I mean, th if I wish to have spiritual enlightenment as yeah. a Buddhist, I need to understand how that you know, be, thinks, and to have the humility mm -hmm. that I must just let it happen. I'm a long way from that, sure. uh, 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 but it's not affecting my work at this time, what, honestly. What, what was the last thing you ever failed at? Oh, I, fa I honestly, I, I, please, I fail a lot. I do a lot of things on any given day, uh, um, but I failed probably the one that sticks in my mind the most. I come from Nowhereville in the Cotswolds, and everyone, can drive at 16. So we didn't own any tractors or anything like that. And it was so important to learn to drive. And after the fourth failure, I mean, four failures, I then did something that I, I just wore a t-shirt and boots and managed to get through the fifth test. But, uh, but you know, I fail at a lot of stuff because I do a lot of stuff. I'm not very good at pretty much any sport. I never was. I'm terrible at family board games, except one that require knowledge of airports in the world, their exact <laughs> terminal locations, which I know inside out. So honestly, I, I'm outside of my business work. I'm, I'm ever so ordinary in the sense of this stuff I don't do. And in fact, on the Rachel, uh, good promotion, by the way, I, I think, but um, when she did the um, questions about you know, the advice, et cetera, uh, that you'd give and, 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 and all of that. I just don't think, I don't do that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just really do four things. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges is women, with women is that they do 200 things and have a list of 90 things. And then you're always going to be failing. So I try and reduce the odds a bit by doing less. Sure. Now, what about, let's, let's talk about money. You earn about two and a half million pounds a year. What, what do you do with it? Do you, do you like <coughs> having that? Well, um, first of all, um, I only earn when we perform. Uh, yeah, no, These yeah. are very high performance targets. No, yeah, no. And the only real money I'll earn at Thomas Cook is if the share price is sustainably high over a period of time. Yeah. So um, I also, I'm very pragmatic around pay. I earn less than the previous male incumbent for this job, and I chose to pitch it there. Mm -hmm. I never uh, support pay increases for myself that are above the average of the employees in the business, whether I've been in China, whether I've been in the US. So I think moderation around pay, and when you perform, you should get paid extremely well. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in inherited wealth, and so I like to do things and contribute to things that I think make a difference. Uh, um, I don't think I'm particularly materialistic. Obviously, the odd bit of clothing and, and jewelry and my fetish for, for high shoes, because I am getting shorter, which is a worry, which is when you said you're coming up short, I thought, how does he know I about that? I dream <laughs> of making a comment about your, your height. I mean, 
That's funny. But it is, and tell us about your place in Thailand. That sounds amazing. So when we, um, when I was living in Asia, um, Asia uh, Thailand is a bit like uh, the Mediterranean for Europe. And mm. so uh, my husband and, and the family, we built a home in Thailand. And because I, I love the Buddhist environment, I truly wish I could become uh, a Buddhist. I find the people a higher order than me. Mm -hmm. I find the whole place entirely beautiful and... You know, it means the family would come. I think if my, you know, if my holiday home was in maybe Croydon or so, they wouldn't come and see me quite so, often, quite so often. No disrespect for Croydon, of course. So, so, and it's, you know, you can do lots of things and escape. And, and so it, it's, um, it's a good place to just ground, peel away the, the layers of pressure and tension that you don't actually think you're absorbing, but you kind of do. And how much time during the course of a year, do you actually get to spend there? Well, I try always and do Christmas and New Year mm -hmm. uh, in... That's in five days. Uh, no, I, no? I, I try and do a couple of weeks yeah. there. And either sort of um, uh, the April Easter period, which is Songkran, which is the year end mm -hmm. in the Southeast Asian countries, uh, their year end, uh, or October. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but other people in the family spend time out there and it's always there. Uh, uh, as a retreat and a place to just remember who you are. Okay. Now, finally, because we're going to open it to the audience, quotas for women on boards. Yeah. You were listening to that. I what, was. What's your line on that? Because, yeah. you know, there were some quite strongly expressed feelings for yeah. and against. Well, uh, I wish I hadn't asked that because, you know, you like to start the section on the questions from the floor with some basic goodwill from the audience. And I'm not <laughs> sure that I'm immediately going to engage 50% of the people in this room. I sit on three boards. Um, Emerson, which is a 25 billion US dollar uh, um, engineering conglomerate in the States. And I sit on BAE, uh, the defense and security business. Mm -hmm. So they're both quite heavy hitting boards. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just my own personal view. As I sit on that board, on those boards, you know, surrounded by the CEO and the chairman of whether it's AT&T or whoever it is, when I open my mouth and say something, uh, I want them to think, I want them to believe, I want them to know that I am there in my own right as a heavy hitter, as a successful woman who has a right to be on that board. And I don't think the equality between men and women is such that you will ever get there if I'm quoted. And so what I always say is, I think this is about three things. It's about us as women, cold calling the chairman and pushing your way into an interview. I think it's about headhunters being less sectorial and less lazy and less cliquey and less in their little groups. And I think it's about chairman. Uh, as well. But the issue for me is not gender, and it never has been. Okay. It's diversity. So, but do, isn't it true that there are very talented women out there who, who, who lack the confidence to ring a chairman in the way that then you do? Then if they lack the confidence to ring the chairman, yeah. are they the right person to be on a heavy-hitting board? It's not that hard. In the, in the Fortune most powerful women, I asked how many women in the room wanted to be on boards, and pretty much every hand went up. And then I asked how many were on boards, and only a few. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a mixture of those three elements, us, chairman, and headhunters. But if you can't call someone up, sure. I mean, what's so hard about that? It's harder. Well, a lot of women would love your, your bravura and your spirit and your I drive to be able to do something like that. I think a woman in this room who wouldn't... Well, how, how many women here would be willing to ring up the chairman of the board and say, look, here I am, I want that job, I want to come and see you and say, why? And how many would find that quite a tricky thing to do? Well, it isn't easy, is it? For Well, if you want to be on a board, nothing's easy no. in life if you just want to toddle no. along. But if you want to be on a board and you want to make a difference and you want to be noticed... It's a very good place to start. Sure. He may not take the call. No, sure. He may not ask to see you, but at least you tried. Sure. 100% of the shots you don't take will not go in. 